Good afternoon. Councilmember Ben Kalos, I've had the honor and privilege of representing the Upper East Side, Sutton, East Harlem, and Roosevelt Island in the City Council for four years, six days, 13, 14 hours, three minutes, and uh, 14 seconds. Uh, I love this job, and every moment is a precious opportunity to make the world a better place, and as many of you know, since I first got elected, I've been counting the time to squeeze in every moment. I want to thank Rabbi Arthur Steyer for today's invocation and for an education grounded in Jewish values that I carry with me today in my mission of tikkun olam, repairing the world. Our wonderful musicians from Eleanor Roosevelt High School, Isabella Bauer on percussion, Azan Chawla on vocals and guitar, Willie Harvey on saxophone, Taylor Lassam Sear on guitar, and music director Scott Anderson. Judy Schneider, my fellow happy warrior for her beautiful reading and for her lifetime of fighting for the East 60s Neighborhood Association. Our Congress member, Carol Maloney, our controller, Scott Stringer, our speaker, Corey Johnson, our Senator, Liz Kruger, Assemblymember, Rebecca Seawright. I want to thank Phoebe Kemick, uh, Shakima Grant, Ed Swisher, and the whole team here at Mount uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering for opening up this wonderful space for us to gather and stay warm today. Most of all, thank you to all of you, the residents who have joined us here this afternoon for our annual report to you, and to hear about the battles we've fought, the ones we've won, those we've lost, as you look towards the future and what we can accomplish together to improve our neighborhood and our city. And if you're just here for bagels with Ben and a free tote bag, that's fine too. <laughs> Today we'll discuss our open office, how we can help you, the funding we provide and policies we pass to invest in education, improve commutes, rebuild our parks, improve quality of life, fight over development, find affordable housing, and reform our government to better serve you. Over the last four years, six days, 14 hours, five minutes and 34 seconds, I've pursued a goal of opening our government to you and my hope to meet all 168,413 people that I represent. I meet residents each month for First Friday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, generally, I get to spend each month that Friday with Elsbeth Ryman, uh, who once worked with Assemblymember Pete Granis, and uh, she is one of the best parts of my job. Uh, brainstorm with Ben at 6 p.m. on the second Tuesday. Uh, my office has mobile hours at senior centers on Roosevelt Island and NYCHA, and I even make house calls for Ben in your building where I can join you for your annual meeting. I also do weddings and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> In the evenings, we hold monthly events, and my staff and I are attend community board, precinct council, neighborhood association, and tent association meetings. In the warmer months, you can find us at street fairs or cooking with Kalos at green markets. And don't forget, a fan favorite, our fresh food box with farm-to-table produce for just $14. We are here to help. We have free legal clinics in our district office on housing, family law, domestic violence, and even life planning. My constituent service team, led by the amazing Debbie Lightbody with support from Tirso Tavares and a dozen graduate students in social work, as well as many of our undergraduate interns, have helped more than 7,500 constituents to stay in their homes, review their SNAP benefits, or follow up on complaints made to 3 and one in an effort to improve the city. If you have a problem, give us a call. We're here to help. Constituent service is about addressing individual problems, but it's also about making the system work for everybody. More seniors in my district aren't getting the hunger assistance that they are entitled to than anywhere else in the city. With so many government benefits, it's hard to learn about all of them, let alone find out if you qualify, and it's even harder to apply. That's why I authored automatic benefits legislation that would use information the government already has to provide the benefits residents need automatically. After authoring memorandums, clearing the legal regulatory framework, releasing the software to provide the benefits in partnership with Intuit, and securing funding to study the long-term impacts, the city has agreed to study this important step from a reactive to a proactive government. I want to thank the voters who came out last year in the primary and general elections, where we won with 7,847 votes at 75% and 22,514 votes at 81% respectively. Uh, it is a little short of the 99.9% .9 that I was hoping for, but uh, <laughs> it's good enough. Uh, but 
voting can and should be easier, which is why I worked with New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman to author and pass online voter registration for New York City so you can register on your phone, snapping a picture of your signature, or just signing with your finger. We can use technology and other... <laughs> we can use technology in other places to make our democracy even better. You as a resident should know how every penny of your tax dollars is being spent. Our city's massive $85 billion budget should be transparent. That's why I authored, negotiated, and passed the open budget bill. While the budget may currently be available in paper or in massive PDFs, you can now search the budget online, download it, and look through it to see how we spend your hard-earned tax dollars. Transparency is one thing, but government should really work for you, and you should have a say in how your tax dollars are spent in your district. Through participatory budgeting, residents 14 and older have been voting on how to spend discretionary capital dollars from my office every year. I hope you'll consider becoming a delegate to help choose what goes on the ballot. So far, the community has voted on where to spend over $3 million in the district on green roofs, new computers, smart boards, science labs, four schools. I've matched your dollars with $2 million in investment in science, technology, engineering, math in our schools. As a graduate of the Bronx High School of Science, I believe every child is entitled to a world-class education. Every year, we partner with world-renowned Auction House Sotheby's to bring hundreds of pieces of art to nearly a dozen public schools in the district for our annual art show. Thank you to PS183's parent, Patricia Corrigy, Principal Tara Napoleone, art teacher Juan Ling Farr, for organizing the event and for the hundreds of talented children whose art we hang at Sotheby's each year. We've also brought Brainstorm with Ben to the classroom. After kindergarten students at PS290 learned about pesticides from their teacher, Paula Ragavan, we proposed legislation to ban them from parks long before the World Health Organization found Roundup to be a carcinogen. Despite having the <laughs> cutest hearing ever, with strong testimony from medical experts, we will continue to fight next year. And as the nation slipped into controversy over transgender bathrooms, students at Eastside Middle School, led by a fearless principal and David Goetz, authored legislation to require the Department of Education to offer LGBTQ training to teachers, share who received the training, and which schools have gender sexuality alliances in order to support their expansion. Students Neil Sarkar, Katerina Kaur, Chloe Shasimo, and Ananya Roy testified before the council and have helped pass this into law. Yes, it's true. If you haven't attended a brainstorm with Ben, proposed an idea, drafted legislation, pass it into law by middle school, then you're an underachiever in this district. <laughs> We do not have enough school seats on the Upper East Side. This was true before I got elected and is only getting worse with all the new construction. With child care starting at $24,000 in the neighborhood, many parents are forced to choose between a career and leaving the city they love. That's why I've been fighting for pre-K for three and four-year-olds since 2013, but when we fought alongside Mayor de Blasio and won funding from Albany, we only got 154 seats for 2,767 four-year-olds. We more than doubled seats in 2015 to 377. In 2016, we worked with Roosevelt Island Parents Network, Day Nursery, and Operating Corporation to open 90 pre-K seats to fully meet the need on the island and nearly doubled seats again to 618. When we actually lost seats in 2017 with 736 four-year-olds applying for only 550 seats, we organized a rally with the support of our Congress member, Carol Maloney, Comptroller Stringer, Public Advocate James, Borough President <coughs> Brewer, State Senator Kruger, Assemblymember Seawright and Court, and Councilmember Gorodnik. As you may have heard, on Friday in the Wall Street Journal, we just won an additional 400 seats, with 234 seats opening in the fall at 57th and East 95th Street, and 180 next year on East 76th Street. I'm sure that need will quickly outpace demand, especially as we expand pre-kindergarten to three-year-olds as part of 3K for All. With child care on the horizon for three and four-year-olds, I hope to continue to expand the program with federal and state funds to two-year-olds, one-year-olds, and eventually infants for a vision of universal child care. But that will take a lot of work, so please join me in making sure that every new construction site or empty storefront with more than 10,000 square feet is considered for pre-kindergarten 
If you need a seat for your child or when you see a space, please email upk at bencalos.com and we'll be sure to work with you. We also need more seats for gifted and talented students in School District 2, which includes the Upper East Side, where 306 preschoolers, nearly half of those who applied, were turned away in 2016. That's why I introduced past legislation that will track applications, offers, and admissions geographically. This will help assess need by neighborhood and give us a better understanding of how geogra geography contributes to school segregation, which in New York City has only gotten worse since Brown versus the Board of Education and must finally come to an end. As we identify need and build more seats, we must ensure children have the support they need to learn. I grew up in this neighborhood in a household with a single parent and my grandparents. That meant I was twice exceptional and eligible for free and reduced school lunch. But I never actually ate the lunch because of the stigma surrounding it. In order to ensure no child makes the same bad choice I did, I fought for and won breakfast after the bell and universal free lunch to provide two free meals a day for all 1.1 of New York City's public school children. And And Local Law 215 of 2017, which I authored, will require the city to set goals and report on increasing participation in these programs. With children out of school at 3 p.m., the workday ending at 5 p.m., if you're lucky, uh, and most parents not getting home till much later, children need after-hours programs and young adults may want jobs which will keep them out of trouble. These programs can be coupled with supper to send children home well-fed with their homework done to spend quality time with their family. I believe that we can meet Maslow's hierarchy of needs for our children by helping them to self-actualize with food they need through universal supper, the love and support they need from adults through universal after school and youth jobs, and the education they need to have better lives. But education doesn't stop in schools and continues in the home where if you can't access a computer with broadband internet, you're facing what is becoming the homework gap. One in four homes in Brooklyn does not have broadband and in the Bronx, nearly one in three homes lacks this essential utility. When Charter sought to purchase Time Warner Cable, we worked with public advocate Tish James and other elected officials to condition the sale on providing affordable high-speed internet to low-income residents. We won Spectrum Internet Assist, which provides 30 megabits for only $14.99 per month for households with students receiving free or reduced school lunch and seniors on supplemental social security income. This has the power to bring affordable, high-speed internet to more than 1.2 million low-income New Yorkers. As children grow up, higher education is only getting more expensive. I'm one of many who will be paying off their student loans until I am close to retirement. That is why in 2013 I proposed and the New York Times endorsed for giving loans for education at City University of New York for students who stay, work and pay taxes in the city and state, repaying our investment in their education several fold in income taxes. I'm proud to say that Governor Cuomo made it happen statewide without any debt, but as an Excelsior scholarship so that students can attend CUNY or my alma mater SUNY, this is an effective investment in our most important asset, our residents. I hope to expand this program further. All high school students aged 16 and older, particularly those at risk or less engaged in academic pursuits, should receive a stipend for GED preparation and exams, as well as completing a free two-year career or technical degree from CUNY's community colleges. Those who might otherwise drop out of school could come into adulthood ready to start a career. For careers in technology, we need higher education institutions of the future, which we built right here on Roosevelt Island at the recently opened Cornell New York City Tech. We just cut the ribbon on the Tata Innovation Center to connect students, researchers, and companies to build the next big app. Look out, look out Silicon Valley, even Silicon Alley, because we've got Silicon Island. <laughs> Getting to Roosevelt Island, as well as the transportation desert that was the Upper East Side, had to be improved. After all, transportation is the economic lifeblood of our city. We finally authorized the decades-delayed franchise for the Roosevelt Island Tram for the next 50 years through 2068. We launched ferry service on Roosevelt Island in the summer and expect it will come to the Upper East Side at 90th Street this summer.
We spent four years every two weeks with our Congress member, Carolyn Maloney, making sure that the Second Avenue subway stayed on track for completion. And we joined our Governor Cuomo in opening the Second Avenue subway. This time last year for New Year's Eve, bringing the queue to the Upper East Side for hundreds of thousands of riders a day. We even brought free Wi-Fi to our subways. On the Upper East Side, we love our buses and have been focused on something even Westsiders can agree with us on, which is improving crosstown service. After, <laughs> after implementing select bus service for off-board payments on the M86, we want an expansion to 79th Street, which opened last summer, and we continue to push for 96th Street. After you voted for bus countdown clocks and participatory budgeting in 2014, we invested $640,000 in 32 bus countdown clocks for the M15, 31, 57, 66, and M72, so you know when the next bus is coming. However, despite the investments in SBS, we've, proposed, we've seen proposed cuts to other crosstown service, the M31, M57, M66, and M72. Uh, though we've been able to, again, work with all the elected officials you heard from today, our Congress member Carol Maloney, Assembly member Rebecca Seawright, Senator uh, Liz Kruger, and our borough president Gail Brewer, uh, to author a letter to the MTA, we were able to save the M57, uh, but we continue to fight for the M31 and M72. We've partnered with the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association, led by Valerie Mason and Liz Patrick, on a petition to save our bus service. If you haven't already, please sign and share the petition at bencalos.com. We're working with Mayor de Blasio to test restricting loading and unloading times from rush hour, as well as restricting double parking to only one side of the street in the East 50s, which if successfully hope to bring to the Upper East Side. In order to improve commutes for pedestrians, bicycles, and vehicles, they all must have a safe space on the street. We added two crosstown bike lane pairs and opened the Second Avenue protected bike lane. With an increase in cyclists, we focused our efforts in a bike safety program that uses education, equipment, and enforcement and has become a model for the city. We offer every restaurant on the Upper East Side free vests, lights, bells, and even helmets in exchange for participating in a 90-minute training in English, Spanish, and Chinese. City Bike offers a free class monthly in my district office on the rules of the road giving participants a free pass or month on their membership. We've even given away 6,000 helmets. And perhaps most importantly, the NYPD has increased enforcement, writing 1,557 summonses in 2017 and confiscating 103 illegal e-bikes, representing a disproportionately high 10% of all enforcement in the city of New York. We've worked with the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association to distribute flyers to buildings and grade restaurants on their use of safety equipment and bikes. If you are interested, please join us in expanding this effort. And if you see or experience a dangerous intersection where you've had a close call, please report it to my office so we can make our streets safer for you and everyone else. You can visit bencalo slash livable dash streets. Traffic safety also means anticipating new dangers such as new garbage trucks that will be driving through our neighborhood when the Marine Transfer Station opens. Though we've fought the dump for years, exposing high costs, building citywide coalitions, and introducing legislation to protect air quality and mandating zero waste, uh, and I will note that our Assembly Member Rebecca Seawright has passed legislation in Albany for uh, air quality. Uh, yes. <laughs> Mayor de Blasio continues to squander hundreds of millions of dollars in building this monstrosity. We moved the ramp to protect 35,000 children at Asphalt Green and most notably forced Department of Sanitation Commissioner Catherine Garcia to agree under oath to give up two-thirds of the 5,200 tons per day capacity, keeping more than 300 garbage trucks off our streets each day. But we still haven't given up. We're tapping into our strongest assets, our residents, like you, and Evan Z. Booker, whose proposal I support to repurpose the Marine Transfer Station. Please join the fight at bencalos.com slash MTS. If you've taken a walk anywhere near the Marine Transfer Station, one thing you've noticed is that the East River Esplanade was literally falling into the river. 
That's why I joined our Congress member, Carol Maloney, as co-chair of the East River Esplanade Task Force. In four short years, we've secured and overseen spending of $190 million in public and private dollars. So let's go through it from top to bottom. Last year, we allocated $1 million to fund irrigation from 96th to 90th Street. Last summer, we opened 90th Street Pier to the public as park space in partnership with DOT, Parks, and Friends of the East River Esplanade, led by Jennifer Ratner. We broke ground this summer on $35 million secured in 2014 to build, rebuild from 88th to 90th Street and points north. In 2016, I allocated $500,000 to repair John Finley Walk from 81st to 84th Streets following recommendations from Civitas. We cut the ribbon in December on a new $15 million accessible 81st Street pedestrian bridge to 78th Street connecting the upper and lower esplanades. We broke ground in October on a $1 million public-private partnership with Hospital for Special Surgery to rebuild 70th to 72nd Street and maintain it in perpetuity, which will soon expand to 78th Street as part of one master plan. This is something secured as a community benefit for upcoming expansions. In 2016, I allocated a million dollars to renovate 70th to 68th Street to seamlessly connect our two public-private partnerships for one look and feel. In 2014, we secured, and in 2016, we broke ground on a $10 million public-private partnership with Rockefeller University that I obtained as a community benefit for their expansion to rebuild the seawall and parkland above it from 62nd to 68th. Contracting is moving forward on $29 million in public-private funding secured as a community benefit from Memorial Stone Kettering to build Andrew Housewell Green Phase 2B from 61st to 60th. In November, we cut the ribbon on a newly planted Andrew Haswell Green Phase 2A under the Alice Acock sculpture at 60th Street. And in 2017, we unveiled the design for an extension of the East River Esplanade from 61st to 53rd Street with Mayor de Blasio, who announced $100 million in funding in 2016 with completion slated for 2022. Yes, that's two miles of new and improved East River Esplanade funded in construction or opened in only four years. And uh, just as a preview, uh, as our Congress member Carol Maloney noted, what's next? That's just the tip of the iceberg. There's even more coming. Uh, we have our work cut out for us. We continue to work alongside neighbors like Charlie Whitman, Harvey Katz, and Ira Shapiro on the 81st Street Bridge, uh, as well as community groups and fellow electeds, uh, Congress Member Maloney, Assembly Member Seawright, uh, and Senator Liz Kruger, to pay attention to projects like the 81st Street Pedestrian Bridge and make sure we improve them where we can. Uh, this location will actually be getting a uh, glass viewing portal uh, and also to keep the project, uh, which took longer than it should have, on track. In addition to opening the uh, 90th Street Pier, we worked with the Community Board 8 Manhattan Parks Committee co-chairs Peggy Price and Susan Evans on a campaign joined by every elected official. You can see them pictured here to open the Queensboro Oval to the public without having to pay $180 an hour at private tennis clubs. This summer, the Queensboro Oval was open to the public to play air-conditioned tennis using the city's annual tennis pass that cost not $100 an hour, but $100 for the entire season. <laughs> the Upper East Side has more privately owned public spaces called POPs than almost anywhere else in the city. Developers received additional height for these public amenities, but they are often closed or in disrepair or do not exist at all. Working with Comptroller Stringer and Land Use Chair Greenfield, we passed Local Law 250 of 2017, mandating POPs to have signage detailing amenities, advising residents to call 311 with complaints, and establishing escalating and ongoing fines. Former Manhattan Chamber of Commerce President Nancy Plager has spent years fighting for improvements to POPs in the neighborhood, and this law was a part of her advocacy. Whether it's in our parks or uh, whether it's in our parks or our homes, we as New Yorkers are sometimes just looking for some peace and quiet. Next slide. In fact, New York City's number one three and one complaint is noise. A report from State Comptroller Thomas Napoli says it's only getting worse. New York City may be the city that never sleeps, but that shouldn't be a result of after hours construction noise waking you up before seven, after six, or on weekends. Richard McIntosh and Pamela Tucker lived across the avenue from one of the noisiest construction sites in the city. 
They came to First Fridays for months, and we did our best to help, but it was clear that the laws were broken. I authored Introduction 1653, which passed the council working closely with the Department of Environmental Protection to poise, put noise mitigation plans online, require rules for inspections when noise is actually happening or going to occur, move noise measurement from inside your apartment to the street, and to allow inspectors to actually stop the noisy construction. And best of all, it turns down after hours construction noise by about half in residential neighborhoods. New York City will be even better when they finish building it. But the 9,000 scaffolds spanning 200 miles of our city would indicate that most of our city is either in construction or disrepair. The problem is that scaffolding goes up and doesn't come down for months or years while no work is happening. Some scaffolding is almost old enough to vote. <laughs> I've introduced legislation working to continue so it's requiring work to continue without interruption for more than a week and to be completed within three to six months or the city would step in and do the work and make bad landlords pay. If you hate scaffolding as much as I do, we need your help to fight real estate interests and get citywide support. Mo Most quality of life problems really come down to a couple of bad neighbors who ignore fines or just pay them as a cost of doing business, whether it's sidewalks that go unshoveled or uncleaned, trash that piles up, noise or worse. And that's why I authored Local Law 47 of 2016 requiring the city to withhold or revoke licenses, permits, and registrations for scoff laws and repeat offenders. While the city has actually refused to enforce this law, we've held hearings calling agencies to task to make them actually improve the quality of life in our neighborhood. Even when neighbors and residents did the right thing, trash was piling up over the tops of trash cans or a gust of wind was blowing refuse all over our streets. Thanks to the persistence of Andrew Fine, who joins me each month at Brainstorm with Ben, as well as partnership with Susan Gottridge, both of whom are with the East 86th Street Neighborhood Association, as well as Valerie Mason at the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association, we launched a pilot to see if new, large, covered trash cans could have an impact. Following positive results and support from the East 60s Neighborhood Association, led by Judy and Barry Schneider, we've invested a total of 175 400 $175,490 on 322 new large covered trash cans for every corner in the district. I owe a very special thanks to these leaders and their organizations. Four years, six days, 14 hours, and uh, 31 minutes and four seconds into my service, according to the voters, these trash cans are apparently the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> In some places, we're still getting complaints, like on 86th Street, whose train stations see as many visitors as Penn Station at more than 20 million a year. We continue our work towards establishing a business improvement district for East 86th Street to supplement city services with daily street sweeping and support for our local businesses. You can help clean up the East 86th Street by getting your favorite business and their landlord to share their support at bencalos.com slash bid slash support. <clears throat> We're also seeing more homeless and panhandlers throughout our city as of the new year. 22,636 children woke up in a shelter with 17,385 parents, 5,309 adults and families, 10,706 single men, 4,061 single women, and an estimated 3,892 people on our streets. To take on this issue in 2016, I launched the East Side Task Force for Homeless Outreach and Services with Senator Liz Krueger and Borough President Gail Brewer, convening local churches, synagogues, and nonprofits with city agencies. We are devoted to building supportive housing in the district to help the homeless. We've been proud to break ground on East 91st Street for 17 two-bedroom supportive homes for women in need, led by former Speaker Christine Quinn, alongside Social Services Commissioner Steve Banks, Congressmember Carol Maloney, Borough President Gail Brewer, Senator Kruger, uh, Assemblymember Seawright, Community Board 8, Rector Jennifer Reddell of the Church of the Epiphany, 
and student leaders from PS527, the Eastside School for Social Action, and Eastside Middle School. We've already been able to help chronically homeless individuals in the community who we believe have long been suffering from mental illness, often spitting. When a resident was willing to come forward and work with me, the 19th Precinct, the District Attorney, and Department of Social Services, we worked together to help get them the help that they need and help them off our streets. We hope to get every unsheltered person living in the in, on the street the help they need. If you see one of our city's most vulnerable on the street, please call 311 or use the 311 app. Ask them to dispatch a homeless outreach team. They'll ask where you saw the person, what they looked like, and offer to report back to you on whether the person accepts our city's offer of shelter, three meals a day, health care, rehabilitation, and job training. Please consider financially supporting our volunteers or volunteering with our ethos partners in the district uh, to help those who are less fortunate. Our homeless crisis is a symptom of our city's long-term affordable housing crisis, with tenants and rent-regulated housing being forced out onto the streets unable to find new affordable housing to meet their needs. As Vice Chair of the Progressive Caucus, I've been leading the charge to protect tenants from harassment, wrongful evictions, blacklists, and rent hikes. We introduced the Stand for Tenant Safety, a package of 12 bills to protect tenants from harassment, with two bills I authored signed into law, Local Law of 152 of 2017, counts violations that are not only hazardous but hurt quality of life for tenants and make them subject to tax, lien, tax liens that help identify bad landlords. Local Law 153 of 2017 identifies landlords of big buildings who have accrued massive debt and forces them to make necessary repairs or else see their property foreclosed on through a program called third party transfer and hand it off to a responsible nonprofit owner. We also help. We also help pass a right to counsel on housing court to help fight wrongful eviction and keep residents in their homes. With more tenants going to housing court, many will find themselves on the tenant blacklist used by landlords to reject potential tenants. Having worked with assembly members Jonathan Bing as his chief of staff on, on state legislation, I introduced local legislation to protect going to court as a human right and worked with Senator Liz Kruger on city legislation to regulate tenant screening companies. Each year, the Rent Guidelines Board votes on rents for over a million rent-stabilized apartments, and each year we lead the council in fighting for a rent rollback to account for the years of increases that outpaced inflation and actual landlord costs. In the last four years, we've won two consecutive rent freezes. We've done a lot for tenants in affordable housing, but what about residents who call my office every day for help finding affordable housing? Thanks to a hero and whistleblower at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, Stephen Werner, we learned through ProPublica that owners of 15,000 buildings receiving over $100 million from the city in tax breaks failed to register any affordable units, leaving New Yorkers roughly 50,000 units short of what they were promised. In response, I authored Introduction 1015, which forces developers and landlords who get hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks in return for building and keeping affordable housing units in their developments to actually live up to their end of the deal. Developers receiving these incentives from the city will have to register these units so we can see where they are and so that low-income New Yorkers can actually apply for new and for the first time existing affordable housing. After months of negotiation, this bill has been passed and is waiting to be signed into law. <clears throat> in the past, developers had been able to circumvent city zoning laws restricting building forms, use, height, and density through something called the Board of Standards and Appeals, or BSA, even though the local community boards and elected officials objected to the board's decisions. At my inauguration, I pledged to focus on this little known but powerful agency and authored laws to reform applications, decisions, notifications, staffing, and transparency around the BSA to be more accountable to the public. Even without going through the BSA, developers have found ways to create new locals in the law to make buildings taller than ever before without any public review. After years of watching Super Tall after Super Tall casting Central Park and our residential neighborhood into shadow, we drew the line on building buildings for billionaires at Sutton. We organized the first 
under the leadership of Dieter Seelig of the Sutton Area Community, then through the East River 50s Alliance, a coalition of 45 buildings, 2,700 individuals from 550 buildings from around the city, led by Alan Kirsch, Robert Schepler, Jessica Osborne, and Lisa Mercurio. We are joined by co-applicants, Borough President Brewer, Senator Kruger, Councilmember Grodnick, with support from our Congress member Carol Maloney. Local heroes like Herndon Worth and Charles Fernandez stood up for the community. <coughs> Though many thought it was impossible, we rezoned the East 50s before developers of the first super Sol site could finish their foundation. We showed residents everywhere that they could lead grassroots rezoning to dictate what their neighborhood should look like with the support of elected officials who worked for them, not real estate. New buildings in the area will be squatter and more in line with the surrounding neighborhood thanks to new restriction forcing developers to use about half of their development rights under 150 feet, thus limiting zoning lot mergers and how tall buildings can get. The super tall developer hasn't given up and neither have we. Please support the effort at irfa.nyc. On the Upper East Side, developers are using and even creating loopholes to build taller than they should, with 16-foot floor-to-ceiling heights, huge empty spaces in buildings that aren't counted against the building height, tiny lots, even buildings on pedestals and stilts. Uh, the building you're looking at is, uh, a, I believe, a 30-story building that goes up to uh, more than 500 feet tall because of that pedestal in the middle, and I've allocated funding to Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District to study how to close these lip tolls for predictable development, and I'm asking you to consider supporting them as well at friends-ues.org. All of these fights mean overcoming the strong influence of big real estate money and politics, whether outside income or campaign cash. When I got elected as a council member, uh, council members could take payments for legal services from Council members could take payment for legal services from developers with business before the city or would get cash payments from the speaker, a practice the Daily News referred to as legal grease. I chose not to take outside income or payments from the speaker and authored laws to end these unsavory practices, making the city council a full-time job. <laughs> I also ended the practice of amplifying the voices of lobbyists who bundled large amounts of money, which will no longer be matched with public dollars. Even with all these victories, 95% of the money raised for mayoral candidates in 2013 came in big dollar contributions, with half of them being $4,950, the maximum amount allowed under the law and more than you can give the President of the United States. Much of this money comes from real estate. This is because the city only gives candidates a little more than half the money they need to reach their spending limit. I proposed matching every small dollar so anyone can run for office with contributions of $175 or less to get big money out of New York City politics. Please sign and share the petition at bencalis.com slash big money out. Okay, we've made it about 10% through the speech. <laughs> Thank you again for joining us today. We've accomplished so much in the past four years, and I ask you for your continued partnership in the years to come. If you found something interesting, anything really, it was a long speech, please join me in making it happen. It's been an honor to serve you as your council member over the past four years, six days, 14 hours, 42 minutes, and three seconds. Thank you.